bless God, isn't it? Amen. We have so much to bless and thank God for. Amen. And we've just arrived at this first Sunday in July. Amen. Right? We're going to talk about independence in a couple of days, but there's no freedom. Like freedom in Christ, right? Amen. He that the Son has set free Amen. is free indeed. Let's give him some praise. Oh! 
me. Amen. For the Bible tells me so. His spirit bears witness in my soul. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good to have you with us this beautiful first Sunday of the month of July. We have hit the midpoint in this year. Amen. As they say, we're on the back nine. So, amen. Time flew by as it tends to do. God is good and gracious towards us, and he's been keeping us thus far. And we give him thanks and display our gratitude for that. We are in the house of the Lord today because we've come here to give him worship and give him praise. So it's all of our responsibility to do so. I pray that you will continue to join us in this service today as we give God glory. This is the first Sunday of the month. And so on the first Sunday, of course, we acknowledge the birth uh, dates of our members. We have, looks like six on our list today. Shania Perry, her birthday's on the 6th. Jerry Brown, birthday's on the 7th. By the way, I'm going to want to sing happy birthday today, which we don't normally do, so just to prize the musician. So Shania Perry, the 6th, Jerry Brown, the 7th. Elizabeth Benjamin, the 10th. I also think I heard, if I heard correctly, there is an anniversary this yeah. month. What, what year, if y'all don't mind sharing? Or you... The 15th. No, it's on the 15th, but how many years married? 43? Yeah. 43. Wow, congratulations. Right. Almost older than I've been alive. <laughs> so, <laughs> Amen. Elizabeth Benjamin and Minister. Lamont Benjamin have an anniversary this month also. Her birthday is on the 10th, however. Stephen Ross celebrates his birthday on the 14th. Our daughter Taylor Borden celebrates her birthday on the 18th. And Sister Diane Smith celebrates her birthday on the 19th. Amen. So we want to say happy birthday. We're going to sing happy birthday this Sunday. To all of them, would you join us? service next Sunday. So business meeting immediately following service next Sunday. Some important items are discussed um, during that time, so we need you to be there as members of the church. Also remember, uh, starting on the 12th, July 12th, so not the week that we're in, but next week, we start our uh, summer convention for the ACOCH. So, uh, the 12th is a Wednesday night. Um, we're here on the Thursday night and Friday night, all night starting at 7 p.m. The 12th, 13th, and 14th, starting at 7 p.m. each night. There will be worship and praise and preaching each of those nights. Uh, we skip Saturday, and then on Sunday, we all come together in the morning. That is a morning service. It is a joint service of all of our ACLCH churches, uh, some of them will be present in our Sunday school at 9.30, but all are expected to be here for 11 a.m. service on the 16th. And immediately following that service, uh, there will be dinner served downstairs. So it's a time of praise, worship, and fellowship. We are encouraging you to be with us during that time. And then finally, I just want to meet very informally and briefly with uh, Deacon and uh, ministers immediately following today's service, literally for a minute, maybe two at tops. Um, I believe that's all I have for announcements. Am I missing anything? All right, thank you. Um, I want to remind you of your tithes and your offering. 
So this is your time for giving. I am triggering your memory, so you should be doing that now if you haven't already done so. Digitally, Zell Venmo, of course, the church's email address as usual, BethelCOCH at gmail.com. Um, and then also for Cash App, dollar sign Bethel COCH, dollar sign Bethel COCH. I will also begin to put something I haven't been doing uh, in the weeks past. I'll begin to uh, begin to give giving opportunities during our midweek, our Tuesday night Bible study too. I don't acknowledge it, but um, I'll give you a chance to do that also. Uh, speaking of Bible study, this Tuesday is the Fourth of July, so we will not be having a Bible study. Not that I mind having it on the 4th of July, but you won't be able to hear me because of all the gunshots and the fireworks. So we're going to skip this Tuesday and resume next week. Amen? Speaking of which, I do pray for you to have a great time off. Whatever 4th of July means to you, many of you will have that day off. So I pray that uh, it is whatever you need it to be restorative, celebratory, just whatever you do, be safe. Amen? Yeah. All right. Um, I want to also remind us of those who are on our sick and shut-in list. Of course, we uh, announced already last week that our young sister Shania uh, Perry, who has a birthday this month, um, has successful back surgery. Uh, she's at home resting, but she does have a, very, a fairly long uh, recovery period. Uh, I am praying that she would have a painless and a quick recovery period. Um, I will say that during the procedure, uh, they, the word used to me was nicked a part of her lung. So there is some additional pain and discomfort because of that. So let's remember her in prayer. Amen. She's strong and vibrant, and we know that God has already brought her through. Amen. We're just thankful for his grace today. Amen. Amen. All right. We are also praying, we're continuing to pray until I hear otherwise for Brother Ernest Porter who, uh, of course, is battling cancer. Uh, that is the, I'm he's sorry? Hospice now. Oh, he's in hospice, okay. Thank you, I have a change of status for him. He's in hospice now. That's the brother of uh, Bishop William Porter of the Washington Memorial Church of Christ Holiness. So remember him as he is in hospice. My own mother-in-law is in hospice, Grace Rice. Remember her in prayer. I learned something new about hospice. It can last a very long time. They send you home saying that it's imminent, but imminent can be a day or a year. <laughs> so let's remember those people who are in hospice because that is, a, uh, it's not only a challenge for them personally in many cases, but it's also a challenge for the families and we know about that. So let's remember these. We're also praying for Sister Gladys Mickleberry, uh, Sister B. Johnson, Deaconess Korea Staten, Sister Frances, Gamble. Let's remember all of those names. There are other names, of course, but those are the ones that have been asked. Um, someone has asked to put them on our list, and so we're calling them out loud. We're going to go to a time of prayer. I'm going to ask that as you pray, whatever names I did not call, but they pop into your heart or your head, just go ahead and whisper them out. God will hear that prayer. Let us partner in this prayer together, believing God by faith that whatever needs to happen will happen. Uh, before I go to prayer, let me just acknowledge that our brother Marcy Opozo is here. Amen. Amen. Good to see him. Amen. It's so strange because your name came up last week and I asked about you, so it's good to see you here. Amen. Yeah. Angel must have tapped you on the shoulder and said, go to Bethel this way. So, so good to have you with us, my dear brother. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your grace towards us, your tender mercies. God, when I say that, I do really mean that, and I know you know that, that my, our love for you is great. But it doesn't even start with us. The love that we share with you is the love you first gave to us when you sent your son to Calvary to die for us. And that love just finds a place in our heart today, manifest. Not only do we share that love toward you, but we share it towards one another. We'll even do that in this prayer as we call out each other's name. But we understand that we are agents and vessels of love. And the love that we show is your love. In hopes that it might compel those who are lost to find you and surrender themselves to you. 
God, you loved us first, and you still love us best. And we're thankful for that. As we come into this house called by your name, we do so with expectation that your Holy Spirit moves amongst us today to do something very special in our presence. And we receive that in the name of Jesus. Yokes are being destroyed. Lives are being changed. Hearts are being lifted. Minds are being lighted. And God, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. For your grace and your mercy towards us as we come to you in prayer, God. Of course, we know that you have given us the freedom to carry our cares to you. And we do that. Time would fail for me to articulate all of the needs that are represented in this house, not just our own, but we carry a burden for others, spouses, children, grandchildren, loved ones, friends. You know what those situations are. We called out names earlier, God, most of whom are suffering with something that is in some way physiological. You created the body and you know the body and we trust you with our bodies. God, show yourself strong. We pray for healing today. Not just for the sake of those whose names we call, but for your sake. That you might get the glory out of their testimonies. But where it is not your will, that physical healing manifests. We pray for comfort and consolation. We pray for a spirit of hope to fall fresh on those lives. Give grace and strength to those who are caretakers for the ones who are afflicted. Give grace and strength for those who take care of Shania, for those who take care of Sister Mickleberry and Johnson and Staten and Gamble and Rice. Give grace to Brother Porter's caretakers. Give grace, God, is our prayer. Give strength and wisdom as important decisions need to be made. We ask, God, that wherever your intervention is required, where the courses need to be changed and circumstances need to be resolved, God, we ask that you would manifest yourself that you might get the glory. We pray for our church. In this church, Father, I pray that your wisdom would go forward, that your grace would fall fresh on us, that there would be a second wind, a new season of renewal. God, have your way. May the leadership of this church be led by your spirit. May we act with humility and wisdom and grace. God, be glorified. Now, where there is sin, we repent of our sins. We acknowledge them. We articulate that we are sorry. And we purpose in our hearts to turn from sin, from those offenses. Where there are weights, God, there are things we carry in life that are not ours to carry. They weigh us down and slow us up. God, give us wisdom to identify those weights, to lay them aside so that we can run the race that you've given us with patience until the end. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. 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 God bless you. Oh God, bless you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. We want to remind you that this is First Sunday, so please make sure you have your communion elements available to you. Immediately following today's message, we will go into that portion of our service and partake of communion together. Amen. I'm going to ask that you turn your Bibles this morning to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon. Philemon only has one division, so just turn to the book. You'll be there. We'll be looking at verses 10 through 16. Amen. And today, as Sister Precious Michael gets ready for the message of song, I just want to preach to you about the mighty and the shadows, the mighty and the shadows, how small role players have big impacts. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let's say amen for Sister Michael. Amen. 
Can you help me sing this? Yes. I'll guide you through it. It's all right. It's all right. I just like for us to sing together. Amen. I need your help. Is that all right? All right. <laughs> Child Onesimus, 
whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Verse 12. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Father, I am grateful in this hour for this time of praise and worship with these your children. As I take this opportunity to share with them your engrafted word, which is able to save our souls, may your Holy Spirit truly be the teacher, the revealer of all things, that our hearts might be encouraged and our lives might be improved to your glory. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. We uh, are in God's presence this morning because of his grace. Y'all know that, right? Amen. We woke up this morning, as the older folks would say, clothed and, well, most of us are in our right mind. Amen. And that's grace. Um, and we're grateful for God's grace. And we must be careful to always share our gratitude. Be thankful, Colossians 3.15. Be thankful to God. Today I want to share with you from Philemon because, first of all, it's a, it's a book in the Bible that is rich with doctrinal teaching. It's the relationship between Paul and Philemon uh, and also between Paul and uh, Onesimus, Onesimus really demonstrates the relationship between Christ and the church in how Paul intercedes for the transformation of Onesimus. But today I want the focus really to be on something that is very uh, evident in scripture and that's that and I'm going to put this in air quotes for those listening to me who can't see me. That little people can have big impacts. The Bible is filled with little people who have big impacts. Now, what do I mean by little? Little in reputation among men. Of little reputation among men. People who don't have titles. Who don't have these huge popular achievements who haven't won the affections of the multitude people who don't stand as models of something ordinary folks ordinary folks having an impact while Onesimus is the scripture text that we read this morning as an anchor for today's message there are actually three people that I want to discuss with you real briefly Barnabas is one, Dorcas is another, and then of course Onesimus. And each of these examples has something to contribute to the conversation about being little but having a big impact. In the case of Barnabas, I want to make the case that our behavior can have a big impact. Small seemingly insignificant behaviors can have a big impact. That's Barnabas. In the case of Dorcas, also referred to as Tabitha, I want to make the case that the things we do for people, which again may seem small, perhaps insignificant, can have a big impact. And then finally we'll end up with Onesimus, 
who most of all shows how all of us have an impact. And it's the power of our story. Our behavior, the things we do, and the power of our redemption story all have an impact. And you don't have to be famous, and you don't have to be known, and you don't have to be powerful to have an impact in God's kingdom. Amen. All of us have an impact. Amen. If I start with Barnabas, in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, again reading from the English Standard Version, it says, And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, talking about Paul, and declared to them now on the road he had seen, or how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him and how to Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus, Barnabas, interceding on the behalf of Paul so that he might be freshly upon his conversion to the faith, be received by the other believers in the community of Christians. In this early Christian community, it was really this man, Barnabas, who stood for encouragement and support. His name, Barnabas, actually means son of encouragement. Barnabas believed in the potential of Paul and others like John Mark and would provide for them the support they needed to go forth in ministry and flourish. Paul's persecutors were those who saw him as a persecutor of Christians, and they found it difficult to believe in Paul, who you know from Scripture was one who, before his conversion, would actually make it his job to go around and find Christians and bring them to persecution, many of whom died as a result of that persecution. Now he is claiming that he himself is a believer, but is he to be believed about his conversion? It's really the efforts of Barnabas that went over the Christian community. He steps forward. He vouches for Paul. Paul rides on the back of Barnabas' reputation. Paul, Barnabas bridges the gap between Paul and the other apostles. Through his encouragement, he plays a significant role in Paul's ministry. So the first group I want to talk to about of the three groups that I mentioned are those who, by our behavior, we make a difference. And perhaps all of us, in one of the three ways, uh, are operating in those areas. When it comes to behavior, Barnabas' behavior that makes a difference is his supportive behavior. You know, I'm, I'm a big proponent that we are blessed when we celebrate others. We are blessed when we celebrate others. Right. Jealousy is petty. Right. It's just straight up petty. There's no reason for it. Just because the sun is shining on you doesn't mean it won't shine on me. It's a big sun. Amen. I need to rejoice with them that rejoice. Right. So I'm a big proponent that we should be celebrating and encouraging others. And that in fact we should be uplifting others. When we see them struggling, Paul teaches this in some way when he says, ye which are spiritual, restore those who you see fallen or overtaken by a fall. Yeah. I shouldn't want to celebrate other people's downfall. Right. A part of being supportive is not just celebrating people who are successful, but being supportive for those who are not being successful. Right. Sometimes people are struggling and you are the arm to lean on. Oftentimes we say in the church, you need to lean on Jesus. Well, Jesus also wants us to lean on each other, right. to be supporters of one another. And when Paul talks to us about how the church is constructed, he uses the, the terms for the body. We are the body of Christ. And he talks about us being different members of the body. And then he says that we supply one another. Yeah. Amen. You know that question that... Uh, that question that Cain asks, freshly off the killing of his brother, when God confronts him in the garden, 
Does anyone remember the question that he asked? Am I my... He must have thought he was so smart when he asked that question. Can you imagine being so deep in your sin you start to be flippant with God? Right? Why are you asking me about him? Am I my brother's keeper? Well, what is the answer? Yeah. <laughs> you are. We are responsible for supporting one another. And if you feel like that's not your job, then you're probably not doing your job. Humanity is constructed to be a community. We were always meant to be a community. That's the way we are built. We are built for relationships. Sometimes we think we're built to work jobs, to buy things and have fun. But what we're really built for is relation. And Barnabas represents the highest form of self. That form of self that is willing to give itself away. The very best gift you can give actually doesn't have a price tag. It's the gift of self. When I, when I sacrifice my time, when I sacrifice my energy, when I sacrifice me, I'm in fact giving you the very best gift that I can give. Well, how do you say that, Pastor? Well, think about it. For God so loved the world. What is the highest form of love? What manner of love is this? That someone gives their life to a friend. So you're saying we've got to die for each other? No. But I am saying we have to live for each other. And again, it's the Apostle Paul who says to us, that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice. So when I quote unquote put myself out there for you, I'm not being a star in any way. I don't get extra credit for that. I'm practicing my humanity the way God wants me to practice my humanity. And a part of that is taking on these, these behaviors that are consistently godly qualities, like being an encourager. The world has a lot of complainers. It doesn't need more. We don't need to add to the ranks of complainers. Trust me, plenty. The world doesn't need pundits. You know what I mean by pundits? People who pontificate about love. People who dig deep into the scripture and show you deep revelations of love from the Bible. We don't need no more of those people. We got enough of them too. What the world needs is practitioners. Instead of telling me about love. Barnabas is an encourager. Now Barnabas stands in the shadow of Paul. Typically when we talk about Barnabas, we talk about him in tandem with Paul. But Barnabas is his own man. He has his own story and makes his own contribution to the kingdom. It's not his fault that we are given to hero worship. That we exalt some and by doing so depress others. We can accept Barnabas on his own merits. Just the way each and every one of us, despite where you stand, often in the shadow of another, you have your own story. And you are leaving footprints in the sand. Your life makes a difference. You are touching others. Wouldn't it be beautiful if we did that intentionally? If we conducted ourselves in a way that made us supportive, because all of us want to be supported. When I ask you to come to something that's celebrating me, I'd love for you to come. But am I going to come to something that celebrates you? I love when you give me gifts, but am I going to give you gifts? Do I only spend money on people or do I spend time on people? Do I spend energy on people? Because that's the currency of love, not money. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. I want to encourage you. Certainly I try to do that every Sunday and every Tuesday when we preach or, or teach a lesson or sometimes when I talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. I, I want to encourage you. Now sometimes you've got to slap your hand a little bit so you don't, we don't touch that. 
We don't do that. We don't go there. But like a good parent, it's always followed up with, but I know that you have this thing in you. So that conversation that uh, Apostle Paul has with Timothy, who is, who is just, he's frantic, he's anxious. These false teachers are surrounding him, and it seems like there are far more of them than there, are, there is that, of, of time and energy that he has. And he's really thinking, I'm not making a difference. And, and Paul writes to him, he says, I know what's in you. I know, I know what's in your mother, I know what's in your grandmother, and you have it too. I wouldn't have laid hands on you if you didn't have it. Encourager. Not everybody feels up to the tasks that they face in life. Not everybody feels worthy. Not everybody feels seen. But I'm telling you right now, nobody in your orbit of influence should feel invisible. You shouldn't be in a space without talking to the people around you. Be an encourager like Barnabas. Yes. And I want to encourage you today that it's your regular, simple behaviors that's a blessing in the kingdom. Yes. Yeah, go knock on doors and share tracts and share the gospel with others. All of that's important. But I am convinced that there is no greater witnessing tool on the face of this planet mm. than your life. Mm. Yes. We are not told that we have lights we are told that we are lights. And we shine through our behavior. Number two, can I share with you about Dorcas? From Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 42. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works. She was full of good works and acts of charity. Barnabas had good behaviors. Dorcas was full of good works and acts of charity, of love. In those days, she became ill and she died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and he went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows, all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Let us turn our attention now to Dorcas. She was known for her acts of kindness and service to the needy. Her impact was not just limited to the immediate recipients of her generosity, but it extended far beyond. Here's the thing. Even the fragrance of your holiness blesses others. Who got that? Have you ever smelled somebody before you saw them? You ever go, mm, that smell good. Who's that? Who's that? Sometimes our lives are that way. The fragrance of our holiness. How many of you know, sometimes your name enters a room before you do? Isn't it beautiful when your name carries a beautiful fragrance? When you have so blessed those around you that it blesses others to hear of your blessing to others. Yes. Mother Teresa died a long time ago and her story still blesses people. The level of selflessness with which she served that indigent community in India still blesses others. Her devotion to the Lord still blesses others. I've shared with you in previous years a part of her story. 
The fact that she existed in what is called the dark night of the soul, that we didn't know for years that she was battling depression and other things. And all that she did, she still wondered if she was having a mark on the planet. Mother Teresa wondered if she was having a mark on the planet. And you think you're alone and wondering if your life makes a difference. All of us at some point struggle with that. If you're a parent, you struggle with that. You ask yourself, have I done enough to prepare my children for this life? And when your children struggle, you ask yourself, is it my fault that they are making these decisions? Sometimes you've got to comfort yourself in the Lord and know that your labor is not in Sometimes you got to wait on change, but change is coming. Because God blesses the works of the righteous. This woman had died, and in her death, she was surrounded by the people that she had blessed in this life. And they were surrounded by people who knew she had blessed those people in life. It is unfortunate. But the fullness of your contribution will probably not be told until you can't hear it anymore. It'll be on that day where we all gather to have what we will refer to as a celebration of your life as you are no longer experiencing it. And we'll get up one by one and we'll be told by the preacher, you got two minutes to tell what you know about this story. And on that day, one by one, we will all string toward a mic and we'll say the things about you that blessed us. And for everybody, there will be some of your behavior. How many times have you been to a funeral and people have talked about how the decedent made them laugh? How vibrant and vital they were in their presence. How they made them smile just, just as they walked into a room. They talk about their presence, their hopefulness, their faith, their courage, their righteousness, behavior. How many times have you gone to a funeral and people say, you know, she cooked so good. I don't care how I felt when I ate her food. It blessed my soul. That's what happens. And that's what happened to Dorcas. But look at what she did. She made clothes. She made clothes. She didn't feed thousands and tens of thousands of hungry people. She didn't shelter the masses. She didn't accomplish huge healing feats. She didn't slay a giant. She didn't fall an army. She made clothes. But the making of those clothes in some way communicated the love of God. What is it that you do in your life on the regular that communicates the love of God? Your labor is not in vain. When somebody needs a ride, do you give it to them? Okay. Have you ever gave money to someone who said they were hungry and didn't have anything to eat and you... You didn't, you didn't mind yourself about whether or not they were going to spend it on alcohol and drugs. You discerned that they needed to eat. Now, what they did with the money was up to them. I can't transform their life on the spot, but, you know, I'm looking at them in the eye. Right. And I got some money in my pocket. Right. How am I going to feel if I walk away knowing this person is hungry? Right. Have you done that? Have you done that? Has someone ever called you and they've been down in the dumps and they just call and they complaining and crying about everything from the sun of the moon? Have you ever just taken out time even though you were frustrated and this person's always complaining just to say, you know what? I want you to know that God is able. Yes. And he wants you to trust him. And while this thing may not work itself out right away, God wants you to know that he'll give you the strength to bear up under this trouble until such time as he decides to bring you out. I want you to know that God loves you. And I also want you to know that I love you, which is why I haven't hung up the phone yet on you. Your life means something. 
I wish in some really real, real way I could communicate to you that everybody under the sound of my voice, your life means something to somebody. Right. And not just because of your organized efforts to minister. Your life is a ministry. Barnabas' life was a ministry. Barnabas had a way of standing next to you and making you feel supported. Somehow when he was in the room, you knew everything would be all right. Because he'd take care of you for the time that you were in his presence. Dorcas made those garments, but she made, she stitched them with love. There was love in every thread, every patch of fabric. It communicated that she sees me and she cares about me. She's willing to sacrifice for me. I know there's somebody on the planet who loves me. Brothers and sisters, I don't care who the person is. From the prince to the pauper, everybody just wants to be loved. And then, of course, we get to Onesimus, whose scripture we read in Philemon 10 to 16. Before I get, get to you, get to him, we've talked about Barnabas. And I wanted to say to you in that, if I didn't skillfully do it, let me just say to you directly right now. His habit of being an encourager made a difference. If I didn't skillfully communicate Dorcas's contribution to this conversation, her simple acts of kindness made a difference. Yes. And now we have Onesimus. Who was Onesimus? There was a man by the name of Philemon. He was a wealthy man. He lived in Colossae. At some point, what we can tell by scripture is that on Paul's missionary journey to Ephesus, Philemon was converted to faith in Christ. And he became a stalwart believer. So much so that sometime later we see a man by the name of Epaphras who is bringing together a community of believers in Colossae. He is able to develop what becomes a church and it's actually Philemon who is now head of the church. This wealthy man who was converted to the faith is now head of that church. He's the leader in that church. But what we also know about Philemon is he had a slave. In fact, he probably had several slaves. But we know he had at least one slave and his name was Onesimus. And this slave escaped and somehow found himself in jail, the same jail that Paul was in. Paul, who had been crucial in the conversion of Philemon, happened to also be crucial in the conversion of Onesimus, the slave, into the faith while they were together in jail. He led Onesimus to Christ. And in his conversations with Onesimus, he finds out, hey, I know Philemon, in fact, I'm in jail because of something I did to him. It is now that Paul writes this letter, having found this out, back to Philemon and says, Onesimus, who has been with me in prison, has been a great aid to me. In fact, I wish he could stay here, but that's not his call in life. He's about to get out, and I have counseled him to go back to you and to reconcile with you. And I want you to receive him back. But now when you receive him, do not receive him as a slave or bond servant. Receive him as an equal. I want you to forgive him and I want you to love him, Paul says, the way you love me. So we explore the story of Onesimus, who had encountered Apostle Paul, was transformed. And we look at what Paul is asking of Philemon. Onesimus has become a changed man. Paul wants Philemon to receive him back to himself, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. How does Onesimus figure into this message about small people having big impacts? In the following way. There are people in your life that know where you used to be. They know where you used to be. They know what you used to be. And to see your transformation 
is a blessing. Watch this. When the women who were standing at the foot of Christ go to look for him, where do they go to look for him? In the same place they last that left him. In his borrowed tomb. When the disciples come to look for him, where do they go to look for him? Likewise, in the same place they at last saw him, in his borrowed tomb. What are the women told as they arrive? In one account, the presence is referred to as an angel. In another account, as Christ himself. They are told that he is not here he has risen. There's a very simple message in that event. So many people in our lives, when they go to look for us, they look for us where we used to be. I don't mean just physically where we used to live. They are looking for the old us. The dead us. The pre-Christ us. The unredeemed, the degener degenerate us. And what a blessing it is to get to the borrowed tomb and see that the Lord is no longer there. Right. What a statement of a victory. Right. What a statement of the exoneration of his faith. Yes. Because they remember the day they counted him out. Right. As he hung on the cross, bleeding to death. Choking to death. Suffering to death. They remember that day. The day of his so-called defeat. The darkest day. The worst day. The worst version of Jesus. They remember that. That's the last thing they remember. What a blessing it is. To come upon that same place. And have it be a witness of his victory. He is not here. Here's what I'm saying. You do that in your life. When you are living a life for Christ. People know where you used to be. They know what you used to be. And what a blessing it is. To come upon you years later. And see the redeemed version of you. The deaconing version of you. The preaching version of you. The serving version of you. The worshiping version of you, the joyful version of you, the hopeful version of you, the forward looking version of you, the upward looking version of you, the empowered version of you, the overcoming version of you. Your story is a blessing, which is why you ought to tell it every chance it gets. Do you know how many times Paul told his story? Of conversion on the road to Damascus. One of, the, one of the most famous facts about Paul. Is how he came to faith. Why? Because he told the story. Your story needs to be told. You haven't always been where you are. One of the great disservice we do to the world. Is not to tell our and for some of us, it's a challenge because our story actually starts in the church. How many of you were raised in the church? It's a lot harder to tell that story because people make an assumption you are always saved. How many of you know the truth? I'll be honest with you. Can I be honest with you for a moment as I wrap up this sermon before we go into communion? I taught Sunday school before I was saved. I ushered in the church before I was saved. I sang in the choir <laughs> before I was <laughs> So to be honest about my story, I got to tell you all of my story. God didn't find me in the streets. Now, now look, I don't feel like my story is less than because I was kind of a squeaky clean kid the way my mom tells the story because you know moms don't never know the whole story anyway. Right? I was never addicted to drugs. I was never an alcoholic. I never went to jail. I never slept around. 
but I would have bust hell as wide open as anybody Amen. without Jesus Christ as my Savior. Right. No, I got a different story to tell. Right. And there are people in the world who need to hear my story as much as they need to hear your story about recovery from addiction. Amen. Everybody's story matters. Amen. And there are people in the church who need to hear my story as much as they need to hear your story about recovering from addiction or alcoholism or uh, having served prison time. And, and very often, particularly in, the, in churches of color, we think there's power uh, only in that story that says that my life was really bad and now my life is really good. Can I just be a witness to you? I don't have that story. But I'm not ashamed about telling you my story because my story has meaning too. Because guess what? My story is a lot of people's story who grew up in the church and who too never went to jail. And who too don't identify with what it means to be an addict or an alcoholic or, or to have some, some serious issue like that. And yet we too were in need of redemption through Jesus Christ. And in many ways, it was harder for us to get saved because people always assumed we were. And the beauty of Onesimus' story is that he found redemption in Jesus Christ. And so often I find myself having to tell my story. And I want to encourage everybody in the room that somebody, maybe not everybody, but somebody needs to hear your story. Somebody was abused by a mate. A lot of bodies, statistically speaking. Somebody was molested as a child. Somebody was abandoned by a parent. Somebody was abused physically, beat, whipped, maliciously. By a parent. Somebody was betrayed by a loved one. Someone had physical affliction in their early childhood that they had to deal with, chronic illness for a long time. God raised you up out of that. Somebody needs to hear your story. Somebody contemplated suicide. Somebody felt alone. Somebody felt abandoned. Somebody felt marginalized and otherized as a child. Somebody needs to hear your story. Somebody had no hope. Somebody had no joy. Somebody had no love until Jesus Christ came along. Somebody needs to hear your story. There ain't no shame in your game when Jesus Christ makes the difference in your life. All of us were saved from something. And others need to hear our story. So whether you are a Barnabas. And the difference you're making is through your behavior. Or whether you're a Dorcas. And your simple acts of kindness are creating great ripples in the pool of faith. Or whether you are Onesimus. And just the telling of your come up makes a difference. All of our lives have an impact. How beautiful it would be if you walked the face of this planet aware of that. And that was my job today. To make you aware of that. You are a living testimony, brothers and sisters. You are, you are, you are 
You are a message against the statistics. You're a message against the statistics. You prove the power of Christ in the life of an individual. And as I look around this room, if, if, if what I discern is true, there are, there are at least a half a dozen reasons why you shouldn't be where you are. There are folks who come from your situation who didn't make it. They didn't make it. Their story doesn't end well. They're not a come up story. They're not a redemption story. And they don't know they can be. They take the very facts of your own life and use it as an excuse to fail. Even though you prove that even despite that you can rise. You can help them folks by telling them your story. Because even small people can be mighty in the shadows. And I'm done on this point. Because the Lord just dropped this in me. And I know he did because of how strongly I feel it. For some of us. It starts with telling our children. Our story. Secrets are the cancer that destroy families. Lord help us today. And your children don't understand the urgency with which you speak to them when you say you need to get yourself together. What they don't know is that you have been where they are and you know how that turns out. Good God for me. And all you want to do is to be that beggar who tells other beggars where you found bread. And sometimes it's having a frank conversation that in the early days I wasn't the parent I was supposed to be. And I didn't do all the things I was supposed to do. And it's, here's where I started. And here's how Christ made the difference in my life. And my son, my daughter, my grandson, my granddaughter, that same Lord can make the difference in your life. I am redeemed. And the scripture counsels, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your grace towards us. I thank you for this moment that you've given me to share with these, your people. I pray their hearts would be encouraged that everybody under the sound of my voice and the influence of this ministry would know just how critical they are to the kingdom building effort. And even the simplest things they do from day to day. We are vessels of your divine power. We have your treasure in these earthen vessels. Yes. So that the world might truly know that the power we demonstrate is of you and not of us. We're grateful, God. Thank you, Lord. Have your way. If you understand my voice and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, this is your opportunity. It is not my job to convince you. The Holy Spirit convicts you and convicts you and draws you. I am just acknowledging your opportunity now to say yes to Jesus Christ. If you haven't done so, or if you have done so, but you fell out of relationship with him, it is time for you to come home. It is time for you to come home. If you are listening to me, if you are here in the building and you want to join yourself to the fellowship of believers, if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to repent of your sins, if any of that is true of you, come now. Come now. If you are giving your life to the Lord and you are not here presently, if you're here presently, you walk forward. If you're not here presently, you can't walk forward. But I want to acknowledge you too and I want to pray with you right now as you make a decision for Christ. And then I want to give you some instructions on the other side of this prayer. If you believe this prayer and if it's true of you, please repeat it after me. God, you are my God. Your son, Jesus Christ, is my Savior. I claim him as so. I know that the sin of Adam is visited on me. And that the wages of that sin, it's death. But God, I know you give me a gift of eternal life. 
It is through your son Jesus Christ who paid that price of death for me so that I might have a right to eternal life. I believe that in my heart. I confess that out loud with my mouth. I am your child. You have forgiven me of my sin. You have freed me from the bondage of sin. You offer me your own spirit to guide me. My God, I receive your spirit by faith in Jesus' name. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. And I am a follower of your son, Jesus Christ. I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer with me and you just give your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to find somebody in your life who knows the Lord as their Savior, who's part of a Bible-believing church. I want you to tell them right now, if at all possible, what you just did and ask them to help you find a group of people to help you grow in faith. You can always reach out to us here at the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness. We would be willing to do that with you and for you. God bless and God keep you. We are going to go now to our communion part of our service. Thank you, brothers. Uh, we're going to go to the communion part of our service. And we're going to read our communion scripture. Make sure you have your communion elements available. Imagine. Our scripture reading is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with the 23rd verse. We find the Apostle Paul giving instructions to the church regarding receiving the Lord's table. He begins, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do sure the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. 
And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together under condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. Amen. Amen. Minister uh, Benjamin, would you come and just pray for the elements before we take it, please? Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for your body, which was broken for, for us. You said in your word that as, if we, as we do this, Lord, we remember you, Lord, yes. and your death and burial and resurrection. We thank you for your blood that was shed for many, Lord, that we may have a right to the tree of life. And so we thank you, Lord, that you left us with your body and your bread and your, your body and your blood. So we give you thank, we give you praise, and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. This bread represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, broken for you and I on Calvary's cross. Let us take it together. said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Let us take it, drink all of it. This week we do a memorial to the great gift of Jesus Christ, his life on Calvary. Let us reflect on that this day and give God thanks for his love toward us. Amen. God bless you for being here and joining us. God keep you until we meet again on this side or the other. Be blessed. Let's remember that next week, immediately following service, there will be uh, a business meeting for the church. God bless you.